Uh, welcome everyone to Brookings. Uh, it's a real pleasure today uh, to be asked to uh, open this meeting uh, of our Central for Universal Education uh, and today's two, uh, two panels, both of which are headlined by two real heroes in this, uh, in this endeavor and in, in, in this body of work. We're particularly proud of the Center for Universal Education and the work that it's done on uh, not just uh, the quantity of universal education, but as we will discuss in, in detail, the quality of education in the developing world and for influencing the development of new international education policies uh, and transforming them into actionable strategies for government, for civil society, and for private enterprise. Um, today, there are more children in school than ever before, but that doesn't mean that the challenge uh, has been met. Uh, I got my own sense of this earlier this year uh, when I spent five months uh, on sabbatical traveling in India and China. And uh, in a state in India, in the state of Bihar, which is a state of about 100 million people, uh, where per capita income a decade ago was about $500 per capita, um, you could really see where good policy can expand educational opportunity. Uh, if you don't know much about Bihar, uh, as, as recently as 2005, only three or four uh, girls out of every 10 girls could read or write. Uh, but in the span of just five years, under the leadership of uh, Chief Minister Natish Kumar, um, who hired 150,000 new teachers, which just to give you a sense is twice as many as the state next door, which is twice as big. So Uttar Pradesh has about 200 million people, hired about 75,000. Yatish Kumar hired 150,000 new teachers, and in five years cut female illiteracy from 70% to 40%. Um, so in the world of quality, I learned and saw firsthand how focused policy can have real impact. Um, so around the world, enrollment numbers have increased but there's also a crisis of learning which goes to the quality of education. Uh, an estimated 250 million ch children are not able to read, write, or count very well, um, yet only 2% of all humanitarian aid goes to uh, not just expanding education but improving its quality. I think that forces us to ask serious questions about whether we are meeting the UN Millennium Development Goals of uni universal primary education and the goal of empowerment of women uh, on gender equality issues. So to get at these and other uh, really critical issues, I have the honor of introducing two guests who uh, really are uniquely qualified to address these issues. Um, I got to know both of their work during my short time in government uh, when I was a young staffer, starting with um, Gordon Brown, who uh, will be speaking. Uh, the other speaker will be arriving a little bit later on. Um, I was a young White House staffer working on G7, G8 summits, first at Denver, uh, where Labor had just, uh, just recently come into power, but then the following year uh, when Mr. Brown and his colleagues hosted us in Birmingham, England. And if you'll remember at the time, that's where uh, Bono and Bob Geldof first started campaigning for debt forgiveness um, and getting people focused on the Millennium Development Goals. And at that time, I think everybody in the U.S. government knew how committed uh, uh, Gordon Brown was on those issues and a lot of the reforms being pushed in, uh, in exchange for debt forgiveness focused on exactly this, improving uh, education. He was recently appointed as the Special Envoy for Global Education by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as part of a new UN Global Education Initiative called Education First. Um, you'll see the materials in the back of the room. Please pick them up if, if you didn't see them on your way out. Um, in this role, he has been working with country governments to increase their financing and commitments to achieving the second millennial development goal of universal education for all children by 2015. In fact, he has just returned uh, from a recent trip to South Asia where he met with Pakistani President Zardari, who has agreed to make education a major priority for his country. Uh, Mr. Brown is organizing a meeting between the ministers of finance of the countries with some of the lowest enrollment rates to look at how to improve financing and delivery of education. Outside the realm of education, um, Mr. Brown is widely credited with preventing a second Great Depression through his stewardship of the 2009 G20 summits, summit, 
He was one of the first leaders during the global crisis to initiate calls for global financial action uh, and introducing a range of, of rescue measures in the UK. Um, a little bit later on, we're going to be joined by Gene Sperling. Uh, just to give you a quick few words about Gene, Gene was somebody that I also saw uh, when I worked at the White House in action. I worked for Gene, among others. Uh, he is now the director of the National Economic Council and assistant of President Obama for economic policy, which is a similar job, uh, or the same job, actually, in title uh, that he had for President Clinton in 1997 uh, until 2001. Um, if anybody has worked with Gene, uh, you know that he's one of the sharpest, most focused, most hardworking, and most effective people, uh, certainly among the most that I ever worked for in all of those regard. Uh, Gene, the reason that I'm mentioning Gene now is that Gene, uh, along with Rebecca, was, uh, was one of the founders of uh, the Center on Universal Education here at Brookings. Uh, it was founded here. It walked a few doors down. We've been lucky enough to have it walk a few doors back in our direction. Uh, and and uh, and we're just delighted to have it as a part of Brookings. <laughs> so with that, I think we're going to ask uh, Mr. Brown to come up or Rebecca to come up and, and uh, formally introduce uh, Rebecca Winthrop, is the director of our Center for Universal Education. Uh, she's been a real leader in this field for many years, and we've just been delighted with uh, the work that she's done and everything she's done here. So Rebecca, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Bill, for the, for the warm um, welcome. Um, when we first started planning this event uh, last year, we thought uh, we'll have a nice little symposium uh, to sort of reflect and think about um, where we are in the field of global education and look back on the recommendations we made in a report that I think many of you have probably seen that came out last June called the Global Compact on Learning. Uh, and at that time, we really thought it was going to be a nice little symposium, and it has mushroomed greatly um, to a much sort of bigger event and a series of panels, and for very good reason that I will talk about today. Um, but just to give you um, first a little context, uh, last year we launched uh, a report called, again, the Global Compact on Learning, and we did it for a couple of reasons. Um, last June, we really we're in a very different situation in global education. Um, and we were really concerned that global education was slipping far and fast down the global priority list. Um, it wasn't a top priority for most senior policymakers. In fact, many senior political leaders around the globe um, were saying that actually education looked like it could be a finished agenda. It was indeed um, the Millennium Development Goal that was furthest to being met for you know, access to primary school. And we heard a lot of people saying, oh, we can tick that box, move on, you know, there's other things in need, which worried us greatly, of course. Um, and our argument was, in the report at least, and certainly the motivation for writing it, was to say, yes, celebrate the great progress that has been made in primary enrollment, largely by national governments around the world. Um, but let's really be um, clear about the depth of the problem. And for us, the depth of the problem is threefold. First, uh, the access agenda has not gone away. There's deep inequities in access, uh, uh, especially within poor countries around the world. Uh, kids affected by armed conflict, girls who are from poor families who live in rural areas, child labor, child laborers, head of households, et cetera. Um, and in fact, we're going to hear more on the topic of child labor in a little bit. I just literally 15 minutes ago, and I urge you all to take a look at it because I've read it before, got this fantastic report um, that Gordon Brown has uh, just released on child labor and education. Um, and hopefully uh, he'll be talking to us more about that. Um, a second big challenge in global education is that even if kids, you can bring them to the school door, they don't necessarily learn very much. Um, and many kids around the world aren't mastering basic foundational skills. And if they do master basic foundational skills, a third big global challenge um, is that they often aren't given the opportunity to build their capacities that would serve them well in their future livelihoods and adult lives. So that was what we were thinking about a year and a half ago. Um, and boy, what a, a difference a year makes. We had no idea when we launched the Global Compact on Learning Report that 
this September at the UN General Assembly meeting, the Secretary General of the United Nations would launch a major global education initiative called Education First. Bill already flashed it, but I'm gonna flash it again because it merits particular attention. Um, and this initiative and this document really um, answers the call for getting more attention to global education. It puts education squarely on the global agenda. It also um, expands the vision of education. It's not just globally for, focused on access to primary school, but on three things, putting kids in school, improving quality learning, and fostering global citizenship. And um, it also uh, has led to, as, as Bill said, the appointment of the first time ever for the sector, a UN special envoy. So I really think um, now it behooves us all, if you haven't read it, do read it. It has actually a number of very concrete targets in it, um, and I will save you from rattling them all off in detail because I know them well. We served in an advisory capacity to the design of, of this initiative. Um, but for me, the bigger question is for all of us today is the education community really has to move now from focusing the question we've been focused on you know, in the past year, which is really um, we need to put education on the global development agenda, to now how do we take advantage of this opportunity? How do we not waste it? How do we leverage it as much as possible and move it forward? Um, and that's the question that we're gonna be uh, looking at from different angles in a series of panels today. First, um, in our keynote presentations from our two distinguished visitors. Um, and then we will have a very short break um, and delve into it in more depth in a second panel um, with a range of, of actors who all have very different perspectives. Uh, again, another short break, and we will have another panel with Pauline Rose, the director of the Global Monitoring Report, who will really give us sort of the latest nitty-gritty uh, data on the status of education, as well as talk quite a bit about youth skills. And then we're going to move directly to a reception, which is right across the way. Uh, and I've been instructed that everybody at 5.30 must exit and go drink all the wine and beer and eat the food. Um, but even more importantly, we're going to be hearing um, from some interesting people. Um, we're going to be hearing from Homi Karaz, a colleague here at Brookings, who's very um, involved in the develop helping to advise on the development of the next global development agenda post-2015, as well as hearing for, about some really interesting initiatives um, from people who represent broad networks of actors on the ground actually doing stuff um, by advancing education. So the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies has an announcement about a new campaign they're doing on education in humanitarian contexts. Um, the Global Campaign for Education and, and Education International will share with us a really interesting work they're doing uh, around teachers. Uh, Plan International and 10 by 10 as well are going to share with us some of their um, campaigns around educating girls. So um, with that, uh, I want to again welcome all of you, particularly those of you who have traveled from far distances to join us. We have people from Asia and Latin America and Africa and uh, particular thanks to the Minister of Education from the Democratic Republic of Congo who was with us yesterday, here with us today. I learned on a side note that there are seven million kids out of school in the DRC, both primary and secondary, and um, they need a lot of support, so we should all um, rally around them. So with that, I want to hand over uh, to Gordon, who um, has, of course, a very distinguished career, but personally, um, I admire him greatly because he is one of the most committed and passionate people around global education that you'll find. He comes from not inside the education sector, but outside the education sector, which I think is a positive. Um, and if you ever get a chance to witness this, he has a magical power where he can um, sit in a room with one or two or three of the sort of top global political leaders who enter the room feeling kind of ambivalent, mildly interested about global education, and after an hour or half an hour with Gordon, they leave just talking about global education. It has to be the top of their priority list, and, and so um, we're really thrilled about your new role and very pleased you could be with us, so please. <clears throat> Can I say, uh, first of all, what a real pleasure it is to be here today at uh, Brookings, uh, to be with so many people who are so committed to the future of education, uh, to be with people who have come from all over the world for this uh, important conference, 
uh, and to be able to say something about how I see the development of education policy globally in the next uh, few years. I want to start by paying uh, a tribute to Rebecca, to the Centre for Universal uh, Education, to the achievements it has had itself, its role in the Education First initiative of the United Nations, which is absolutely pivotal, and to Brookings uh, itself. Uh, I, I was, by the way, uh, Rebecca, once uh, a university lecturer. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Brookings and uh, academic institutions uh, stand for objectivity, impartiality, rationality, the disinterested pursuit of truth, and the search for knowledge. And these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> I, I'm also uh, uh, delighted that so many people uh, who represent uh, uh, some of the most important uh, pressure groups and cause groups in, in education are with us today. Uh, I'm going to be saying something about conflict, and INEE -E is with us. I'm going to be saying something about girls' education and women's thrive, uh, and many other groups committed to uh, women's and girls' education is with us. We have the uh, representative on education first from the youth uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, group uh, with us today, Joseph, and I welcome him because he's also from the DRC, as I welcome the delegation of ministers I've just met in the last hour to talk about education policy uh, from the DRC. Now, you may wonder why I talk about education. In the 1990s, there's a story that, that really affected me greatly that has never left me. Uh, if you go to the, Rian the Rwanda Children's Museum, and I don't know how many people have actually visited it, uh, the museum that was uh, created after the genocide in Rwanda, you will see pictures of young children who were victims of that genocide. And there's one picture that uh, st stood out for me, uh, and I'll never forget, and it's of a boy called David, and there are very few details about his life, uh, but these details are these. It says David, with a photograph of him, age 12. It says ambition to be a doctor. It says favorite sport, football. It says pastime, making people laugh. And then it says death by mutilation, last words, the United Nations are coming to help us. And these were the words of a young child to his mother who also died. And in his innocence and his idealism, he believed that the global community would come to the aid of a child and of children in a country that was facing uh, genocide and mass uh, torture. And I uh, really made a resolution then that whatever else I was going to do in politics, I wanted to make sure that every single child uh, had the best opportunity possible uh, and that we would do everything we could as a government and then anything I could do to make possible opportunities uh, and the potential of these children uh, to be realized. And so when I finished in government, one of the first things I did was I went to South Sudan. And South Sudan, as you know, is the newest country in the world, uh, but it's also got some of the oldest problems. And when I went to a village just outside Juba uh, in, uh, in South Sudan, I met a group of uh, women. All of them uh, were teenage uh, brides. Some had been married at 12 or 13. All of them had uh, children. All of them faced enormous uh, challenges and problems. Uh, there were safety issues because of the violence in the country. There was issues about shelter and about accommodation, about housing. Uh, they could not be sure where the next food and the, the next uh, uh, um, nutrition was going to come for them and for their families. But when you asked them what they wanted most, these girls, uh, teenagers, women, all of them said, all of them said, education for the children. All of them said that what they wanted most was what their children had the chance to go to school. And then you walked out of that hut and you walked up to what was the school. And it was a, it was a simple prefabricated hut run by a great organization, maybe here today, Brak, uh, the Bangladesh organization that provides these one hut rural schools. There were 20 children in this classroom. Uh, there were two teachers. They had a small number of books. They were trying their best to give these children an education. But what I remember most of all about that visit was there was a small portal, a small window. And uh, looking in that window at the 20 children there were perhaps 40 or 50 other children who were looking in at something they couldn't have. They were looking in at something they were being denied, the chance of an education. And they could see for themselves that their chances were being limited by their inability to be able to be one of the pupils in a limited school because the resources were not there and the provision was not going to be there for some time for education. 
And as you may know, in South Sudan, 35% of children are not at school. A million children in total are not at school. Perhaps the most significant figure that makes people sit up and take notice is there are only 400 girls in senior secondary education in a population of 10 million. Now, if that was another area with 10 million people and you had compulsory education, there'd be 100,000 girls uh, with the chance of uh, secondary education, 400 only in South Sudan. And here is a country that is trying to build out of conflict. And I drew two conclusions. First of all, that there was a willingness and a desire for education, but we had not been able to properly coordinate the delivery of that primary and basic education, far less secondary and tertiary education, that this was not something that was impossible because we needed some technological or scientific breakthrough to do. We needed the capacity to organize and deliver the resources that were necessary, and this could be done not just by using governmental agencies, but using all the delivery agents from the churches to the BRAC organizations to save the children and all the action aid and other teacher training organizations in that country. What we needed was coordination and then the resources to back it up. And secondly, I concluded that there is insufficient public opinion, there is insufficient pressure on both governments and on the international community to make education and the uh, chances for these children a priority in the international community. So we have two problems, two challenges. First of all, we are not coordinating the delivery of education in the best possible way, and we've got to think how we do it, given that we have 61 million children who are still, uh, got the, who are still not at school, and we have many millions more who are getting a poor quality education. But we have insufficient pressure, and this is why it's so important that all of you are here today on the governments of the day and on the international community to make the delivery of education a priority. And then a few weeks ago, something else happened that made me think, and I think makes us think today. Uh, when I uh, saw uh, the shooting of Malala Yousafzai in Pakistan, and I'd just become UN Special Envoy, I decided that it was a duty on my part to take up her cause. And just like many millions of people around the world have now taken up her cause, I decided that it was essential. We had a petition, we had a film, we had a, an opportunity for people to make sure that they registered their protests at something that was completely unacceptable. Just remember that Malala was shot because she wanted to go to school. She was shot by the Taliban because she was insisting that she and other girls had a right to go to school. When the Taliban entered that bus on which uh, she was sitting with her fellow uh, pupils uh, that day and asked who was Malala, she boldly and defiantly said, holding the hand of another girl as she was about to be shot, said, I am Malala. And that's why that slogan, that headband that you can see in so many pictures around the world, I am Malala, has been adopted by so many girls in Pakistan, which I visited in the last few weeks. And that's why it's gone around the world. And forever until we have girls' education that is universal, I believe that Malala will be the most powerful symbol for a girl's right to education. And what that proved to me because there were a, a million signatures uh, achieved in uh, the world, a million extra signatures achieved in Pakistan, a million children are now signing the petition in Pakistan as out-of-school children who are demanding their right to education. And what that showed to me was, yes, it is true that people are more likely to be moved, and I understand this, when they see famine and suffering and malnutrition. They are more likely to be brought to action when they see uh, people suffering through ill health but what people are starting to understand is if we're going to break the cycle of poverty, if we're going to make sure that people have the opportunities that a modern society must deliver to individuals, girls and boys, then we must move more quickly and with more speed and with more resolution to delivering universal education. And I believe that people are increasingly seeing that the arguments that we've been addressing for years are now center stage in the battle for the future of both economies and societies. We know that education and universal education is essential for individual opportunity. And I'm struck by the fact that despite our knowledge that 80% of the inequalities that are visited among people in the world are due to birth and background and not due to how hard you work and, and whether you've got a, a qualification or whatever, that we still are spending only $400 on average on the education of an African child compared with what we spend in the West, about $100,000 on the education of a child from 5 to 16. And that the gap in opportunities 
makes it uh, almost uh, a travesty to say that we're living in a world where you can rise by talent uh, if, you, uh, if you have that uh, talent and that potential. So we must stress the importance of education to opportunity. We must also stress the importance of education to empowerment, as has just been said in the earlier speeches. And I'm struck by the fact that if you look at girls' education in particular, it is education that will unlock the other Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the maternal mortality goal, the infant mortality goal, the goal about gender equality, uh, all these other goals, the poverty goal, will be better unlocked by investing in education and giving girls in particular the information, the knowledge, the ability uh, to feel confident about the future. Uh, and my wife, Sarah, who was involved for years and still is in the maternal mortality campaign to, to reduce maternal mortality, uh, she has come to the view that the biggest breakthrough that we need now to reduce the numbers of maternal deaths is amongst young teenagers where the numbers have remained stubbornly high and the biggest barrier to that is the lack of information and education that is available to young girls. So we are now understanding education is important not just to opportunity but to empowerment and I think we understand also the importance to security and I just want to make this point. I was in Abuja a few months ago uh, and I went to see a school just outside the capital and I arrived at that school and it was a dilapidated uh, building, corrugated iron roof, it was uh, really falling apart. And as I arrived at the school and walked into the classroom, suddenly without my knowledge, another set of cars drew up uh, with television cameras and everything else and Bono had decided to visit the school as well. So I arrived at the school and there was Bono and uh, uh, he, had, he had a bigger audience than me as you might expect and we went into the... We, we, and, and more cameras, and we went into the, we went into the classroom. And as you do, and, and you would do the same if you were in a classroom, you'd ask children what they wanted to, to do and what age were there, but particularly what occupations they were interested in having when they were, when they were um, older. And of course, uh, uh, scientist, engineer, airline pilot was very uh, popular, uh, teacher, uh, everything else. Uh, nobody wanted to be a politician, by the way. Uh, and to Bonner's shock, nobody wanted to be a pop singer either in that, uh, in that uh, school. But you know, in that school, with these terrible conditions, three children to a desk, at least 100 in each uh, classroom, the place falling apart, they were losing pupils uh, to a madrasas that had been created up the road, huge investment, uh, religious indoctrination, sectarian ideological uh, bent, uh, and because it was offering education free of charge of uh, high quality facilities, uh, we were losing the battle with a new generation of young people and this is why education is also a security issue that I think uh, Brookings and uh, other people who study this in the United States will be interested in. But it's also vital to the importance of our economy. And I think one of the areas where we've got to do further research is the relationship between education and the economy. And I know you've got uh, Professor Heckman here tomorrow who's done vital research on that. But increasingly, I think we are able to persuade people there is no country in the world that is going to move to be a successful country unless it invests in education uh, for, for, for the future. India will reach a barrier very soon about its development because of the high levels of illiteracy in this country. People now argue that in Latin America, and there may be people here from Latin America, that no country has moved from middle income to being a high income country in the last 50 years. And one of the reasons is that educational standards have not been high enough in some of these uh, countries. Now these are all issues of controversy, dispute for academic debate, but I think we'll come to see uh, that human capital, education, the development of talent is the most important issue for the future in deciding which countries are going to be rich and poor, which countries are going to be successful and which countries are fail. So we are in a position to be right at the center of the debate about the future. But first, in my view, we must have a clear plan that we meet the Millennium Development Goal and then build on it after 2015. That means we need a plan to get the remaining 61 million children to school and then build on it with quality education. And I want in conclusion to suggest three things that we've got to do. The first is we've got to get these countries that are failing into what I call the accelerated Millennium Development Goal process. And the United Nations family of institutions has created this accelerated process where each country that is failing so far and off track and DRC knows it's off track and it's to their credit they're coming and saying they want to be part of this process accepts that they must take extraordinary measures in the next uh, period of time so that they have a chance of meeting the Millennium Development Goal. This has got to be initiated by the country itself but it's got to have the support of the international community. So in the next few months 
I want to see at least 10 countries, because half the children out of school are really in six or seven countries, but at least 10 countries, part of this accelerated process. And I want the academic community to support us in analyzing what are the barriers and the blockages to achieving this final stage of getting every child into school. And I want us uh, to look very carefully at child labor, at child marriage, at child uh, domestic service, but I also want us to look at the lack of teachers, the lack of quality in education, the lack of school buildings, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of books, the inability to apply technology to education, nutrition, uh, sanitation, all the issues have got to be looked at very carefully so that we know exactly what we've got to do and each country knows what it has got to do. And the second thing that then has got to happen is that the international community has got to be more supportive. There is a complacency, as uh, Rebecca has said. People assume that if it doesn't happen next year, the year after, or the year after that, it's an inevitable process that every child will be at school. I don't see it that way. And I believe that the international community must do more. So we've called people together, as was said a few minutes ago, to a summit here in Washington on April the 19th, where the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has put his full weight to his great credit behind uh, Education First, uh, Ben Ki-moon, the heads of the UNDP, of UNICEF, the heads of UNESCO, the GPE, the, all the organizations that are involved in the delivery of this goal at an international level will meet with individual countries hour by hour to look at what we can do to build on these individual reports and see how the international community and uh, the individual countries can come together to agree here are the next things that we are going to do as a matter of urgency and immediacy to move towards meeting the Millennium Development Goal. And I believe we will find that there are many things that can be done that are not costly. There are many things that can be done by the countries themselves, as well as things that can be done by the international community to be supportive. And all the time we must be thinking how we can get people into schools, but also how we can build quality, creative, transformative education that leads to secondary education being universal in not so distant a period of time, and leads on, of course, to the uh, creation of uh, greater opportunities for people in tertiary, vocational, and higher education. But the third thing, in addition to the accelerated process and the international community coming in a united way with all the organizations as one supporting this effort, is we have got to build a public opinion. We cannot be complacent. Uh, we cannot believe uh, that we can move people to action unless we make the effort. And I know from my experience of the last uh, few months how difficult it is sometimes uh, to get people motivated to take education as seriously as we do. But I also know from the experience of uh, what happened to Malala that there is a ready set of voices, ready uh, people prepared to listen. And what I do know, and this is, I think, very interesting, that children themselves are starting to make their voices heard. And it's not just Malala and all our friends around the world. If you go to Bangladesh, the child uh, movement uh, that is against child marriage and de declaring child marriage-free zones is a movement of young people themselves. And I just want to finish by giving you one example that I think people will sit up and take notice when they see and should, because it ought to lead to immediate action. And I refer to the numbers of children who are now working when they should be at school. There are probably 200 million and more children who are in some form of work, whether part-time or full-time. There are certainly 15 million children under the age of 12 who are working full-time and unable to be in any form of education. And we owe this study of the relationship between education and work, and child labor in particular, uh, to the UCW, uh, the uh, Italian uh, researchers Furio and Kevin Watkins, who have compiled this report that we are publishing today. But you know, when I went to India a few weeks ago, and I met Kailash, who runs the Global March Against Child Labor, who many of you may know, who's been involved in the global campaign on education for many uh, years, and I'm pleased that Education International and the global campaign are here also uh, uh, today. Uh, he showed me and introduced me to a large number of children who'd, sit, who'd recently been rescued from bonded labor. And he showed me and, talk, and I talked to eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds the eight-year-olds who wanted to be policemen because they knew that that was the way to get other children in their situation out of child uh, uh, labor. And then we talked about what was actually happening in India. And we realized that even at that moment, there were people he knew of who were using child labor in the most exploitative way in dingy uh, uh, workshops 
in cramped conditions, uh, incarcerated, imprisoned young uh, children to make the Christmas decorations, the Christmas presents, the Christmas gifts, the Christmas trinkets and baubles that are being bought in our shops in America and Europe uh, this, this week. And his bravery and the bravery of his colleagues in secretly filming the conditions in which these children were working, making these Christmas donations, will make you sit up and take notice by seeing that in itself. But also their courage in rescuing these 14 children, first of all two and then another 12 that they have subsequently found from uh, child labor making these Christmas goods. Every one of these children had been trafficked in one way or another, sold in some cases by a relative into bonded labor. They were working 14, 15, and 16 hours a day. Many of them had injuries because they were working with glass and their fingers were, and hands were lacerated as a result of the work they were doing on uh, picture frames and on other items that involved uh, glass. Uh, and he and his group have now released these children from that form of slavery. But there are so many more children in that position who have been denied the chance of education. In India and Pakistan, of course, Bangladesh, but also in Africa, where in the cocoa mines, in farms, in factories, in other forms of mining, children are being used ruthlessly at the ages of six, seven, eight, and nine. And it is something that the world should be angry about, and they should feel that it is absolutely shameful that in the year 2012, we tolerate it. Uh, someone once said uh, that uh, hope was such a, a vital uh, quality. They said, it takes, it takes, he said, uh, 30 days. You can survive for 30 days, he said, uh, without food. Uh, you can survive for eight days without water. You can survive for eight minutes without air. But you cannot survive for a second without hope. Now, we must give these children hope, the hope that we can actually change things, the hope that we can alert public opinion across the world to do something about it, and the hope that by the end of 2015, we will at least have achieved the Millennium Development Goal we set in 2000 and never be accused of betrayal of promises that we freely made but have yet been unable uh, to deliver. In uh, ancient Rome, it was said that Cicero used to come and make speeches, and when he made speeches, people turned to each other and said, great speech. But in ancient Greece, when Demosthenes spoke, and he went and gave speeches about the conditions there, people then turned to each other and said, let's march. I think we should be marching against child labor, but we should be marching against all forms of child exploitation, and we should be determined that the alternative to that is that one, we promote religiously and ruthlessly over the next few years, that every single child in the world should have the chance to bridge the gap between what they are and what they have it in themselves to become and be given the chance of a decent education and one that we can be proud that we play a part in delivering. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I want you to see this film on child labor and I hope that you will then sign the petition and persuade other people to sign the petition because in the next 20 days, the Indian parliament has a decision to make. It can decide because there is legislation there to abolish all forms of child labor under 14 and we can play a part in helping them make that decision. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, for those of you who know what I do in my day job, I'm not gonna pretend I was the one person in the G8 who was willing to make this his issue. Uh, I, he had so much time for those of us who were in the advocacy and NGO community repeatedly, I mean personal time to be briefed and to discuss things, time to do events on Global Education Day. Uh, so it's just so fitting and not surprising that, uh, that uh, uh, after having been head of state, uh, that uh, when you think of all the things he could have done, that he's made his passion now, uh, what his passion uh, uh, was then, which is uh, education in developing countries. And so I, I just praise him so much for being uh, the type of leader and champion that is so uh, deep, deeply needed and for his continuing passion. Uh, so I, I'll just say a few words. Uh, there's not probably much I can add. Uh, I look out, uh, I just saw Carol Bellamy in the way in. I see Rita, I see so many people. Uh, I'm sure if I had my glasses on, I'd recognize a lot more people. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is not a group that you, you probably need to uh, educate a lot on education. Uh, I will say, and I've said this 
you know, for those of you who've heard me talk before, um, you know, w when you're in the world of advocating for e education, you do realize some of the challenges that you face. Uh, one I always used to note was that nobody ever really sees a moment where a CNN camera captures a child dying from a lack of education. Uh, and so for some reason it may seem less of a crisis or less compelling because you never see that moment. And yet, all of the work all of you do, all of the data all of you bring makes very clear children die from a lack of education all the time. Uh, we know what five, even five years of education means in terms of infant mortality, in terms of whether a child lives to five years old, to uh, whether the chances of a young woman contracting AIDS if she's in secondary education versus one who's never gone to school. Uh, we've all written about it. We know it is fundamentally a life and death issue. Uh, but we, we have to make that clear to people. And yet, and yet, what really compels us to work on this issue is not that uh, uh, young children fundamentally lose their lives, but because it is fundamentally life enhancing. Education as much as anything else is I think what connects us uh, in ways that are so important with uh, children, uh, poorest children in the poorest countries in the world. I always have found is very difficult and many of you know this, that in your efforts, in the efforts to uh, create a movement, compassion, to make things compelling, that you can often present the young people you're trying to help as destitute victims, as if the goal was simply to help a person live another day or take a miserable, miserable situation to just a miserable situation. But it's not that way with education. With education, that is the one easiest place for everyone to see their own child's eyes in the, child, in the eyes of a child in Afghanistan or Liberia or South Sudan. Uh, so many of you have gone and visited, as I've been lucky to do, uh, as I know Gordon and Rebecca have been able to do, schools across the world. And you go into the poorest school, 100 kids, uh, uh, and you say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And everybody's hand shoots up. And unlike the United States, where the majority of kids would say, rock star, rapper, Derek Jeter, uh, Katy Perry, uh, they want to be doctors and teachers, because those are the two types of people in their lives they see helping others. It is so touching, and yet it's so heartbreaking when you look at that hundred kids in there with their hands up who want to be doctors and teachers and know statistically how few will be there still when they get to sixth or seventh grade. So education, you know, when we did our book, uh, uh, What Works in Girls' Education, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but we took the cover very seriously. Um, we went around until we found pictures of girls with their hands up in class, with their hands up, just couldn't wait to be called on. Uh, they're not victims, they are just your daughters, your sons, they're just dying for a chance for education. Uh, Rebecca was gonna ask me later what, you know, if there was kind of a moment where you knew you wanted to commit yourself to this, uh, I always told it was my first school I ever went to in uh, Senegal, and it was just a school for just first graders and second graders. That was it, just first graders and second graders. And the village was so proud that they had a school, even though it was just for first graders and second graders. And um, the uh, 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 so <laughs> there were about 70 kids to a class. So we went to the second grade class, and I had somebody for the, from the embassy with me who was a little stiff, and he suggested that I not take any questions from the kids. And I said, why? He says, well, you know, they're very, very poor. You're the most well-off person they'll have ever seen. I I'm worried that, you know, they'll ask you for your belt or your shoes or... <laughs> I said, you know what? We can risk it. Um, 
So a little boy put his hand up, and he was sitting on his dad's lap. And I mean, you had to see it. Short, barefoot, but this little ragged tie and this little ragged suit that he had worn for the American government official coming. And he put up his hand, he just, and his question was, do you think next year we could have a third grade and a bathroom at our school? I think I cry whenever I think of that. Here's a second grade kid. He just wants to go to third grade, and you're just sitting there celebrating the school. But of course, all these kids in second grade, this is the end of the road for them. And so I went to the, and got to give one of the keynotes then at Dakar, at the Global Education Forum. This was, this was what I was doing right before I went to give my speech. And I told that story. And by the time I was done shaking hands, somebody had, had donated $60,000 to build a bathroom and a third and fourth grade uh, at that school. And I think that was a moment where you knew this was something you wanted to focus on. The last thing I'll just say before I um, open up uh, to go to the conversation is, it is hard, uh, to be perfectly honest, to be in the exact position I am, because as most of you who worked with me know, I was unrelentlessly hard on uh, those who are in government jobs like mine. Uh, why aren't you doing more? Uh, I'm not, I don't regret that. Uh, during that period, I think we saw financing in the US government go up from 150, 200 million. I think I see Steve Mosley out there somewhere. Probably up to a billion. It was probably beyond what our expectations were at that time. But we knew once we reached that, it would still not be enough. So it was positive. And we do need, the global community needs to come forward with more resources. There is no question this is a hard time, going through the worst global recession since the Great Depression, every country dealing with the crisis they are. But we still have to push. We still have to push to expand, push to maintain, and push to do things better. The one thing I don't think we should let ourselves get into as much, though, is uh, a dichotomy between the access and quality issue. There are some things you have to walk and chew gum with, and this is one. Uh, you have to do both. They are not, uh, they're not choice, they're complementary. Uh, they're very complimentary. Um, yes, I have heard people say we should slow down on access until we get quality going. I always remind people that that's something you could never say in your own town or in your own family. Nobody comes into an education forum on domestically at the Brookings Institution and says, have a really excellent plan to increase learning and quality in Washington, D.C. Let's have 40% of the kids stay home. So that's kind of an argument you make about other people's children, not your own. And so you probably shouldn't make it about any children. Um, that said, uh, as one who uh, did spend a lot of time advocating, I also know very well that we have to show provable success. I believe there is great good in just getting children in school. I do. I watched that video that Gordon Brown just showed, and you know what? I would have one of those kids be in a school and have that social environment, even if it wasn't the greatest learning thing, a lot better than uh, the alternatives. Gordon, I, uh, I went to, I went on a trip to India, uh, met with kids who had been child labor, and there was one kid, he looked a little marked up, he was, and he was nine years old. And someone said, you know, well, you know, this is kind of tough. He said, well, he says, you know, it's, it's not that bad. He said, you know, it's just, it's hard for me on the train on the way there every night. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, on the train, on, when I'm taking the train on the way to whatever his destination was, he said, the, you know, the porters, the security guys, they beat me. He said, but once I can shine enough shoes, I can bribe them on the way back, and it's not too bad. And this is what he did every night even though he was going to school. Um, not a very good situation, but it was still good to see that young kid with classmates smiling, having friends, at least having a childhood. So I'm for access. But I will say, 
you have to show learning and results because if you don't, it undermines the whole mission uh, in a couple of ways. One, we all know that at a lot of the ground level, the challenge is not that girls don't want to go to school. It's not even often that their leaders don't want them to go to school. Let's be honest, you know, their parents don't always see that their parents suffering from extreme poverty don't always see enough of the benefit to justify the loss of their help around the house, et cetera. And we talk about all the incentives that we have to do, eliminating fees, correct, uh, uh, having shorter distances, correct, having water nearby, correct. But you also have to show those parents that the child is learning and succeeding to inspire them to keep going to the next level. So at the lowest ground level in inspiring parents, you have to show learning. And then at the highest level you do. Because when you walk into the rooms in the toughest of budget times and you say, you know, in a very, very tough budget, take an extra, find an extra 50 billion, find an extra 80 million, find an extra 800 million. People are going to raise the bar. Can you show this works? What countries can you show reading has gone up, learning has gone up? So that is why I don't see these as choices. I see them as complementary. You have to fight for access and you have to fight for quality, for quality's sake, but also to expand the case for access, the case for greater resources. So, um, you know, there are some people in this room who are advocating, spending their time advocating for more resources, for access. There are others that are spending their time working on a controlled experiment to show what practices are best for reading. And I want to say, God bless all of you. Every part of it's needed. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that you know, we need to, in the Obama administration, I think we have to, we've done so much on health and agriculture, uh, but we've also fought very hard to maintain our support for education and to put a focus on making sure that everywhere, as we say in our country, that early in life you learn to read so the rest of your life you can read to learn. We, that is a very important mission. We as some of the most significant bilateral donors of some of the biggest African countries, Afghanistan. We have that ability, even in a constrained budget case, to show success, to focus on that, to build the case that you can do more uh, uh, and that you can push more resources and which hopefully with a stronger economy, you know, the world recovers, will be easier to do. So I compliment uh, everything. I think Raj Shah and our folks at USAID are very committed, uh, uh, really wanted to uh, continue their leadership and learning, support very much the work Rebecca has done for the Compact uh, for Learning, uh, and uh, consider ourselves partners with you, and partners with uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Gordon Brown as well uh, in really leading what is a global mission and being that for so long missing high profile advocate that the world's long needed. So thank you very much. Are we live? Yes, there we go. All right, well, what did I tell you guys? Incredible passion, right? Um, thank you, both of you. Um, and uh, I have to say this. Uh, thank you for hiring me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and my boss, Kamal Dervish, for recruiting me to this job. I didn't say that part before. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, again, just a couple of reflections, something that we think about a lot here at the Center for Universal Education are what are some of those big picture things that move issues, um, that make a sea change, that make a breakthrough. And I think high level champions are one of them. And I think we have two incredible um, champions here. Um, and both of you expressed uh, sort of personal experiences that converted you into being champions. And I think we should all take note as we go out and try to recruit other champions from outside the sector, those type of experiences are probably really, um, really important. So we only have a couple minutes left. So let's do a f take a several questions and, and you both can respond. Um, yes, one, two, three, four, perfect. Just the right amount, Louise. Hi, so I'm uh, Louise Zimini from the Early Childhood Consultative Group. And uh, so I agree that we have to have passion for advocacy and you have the platform to do it. Uh, so I'm inspired by that, but I am a bit disappointed uh, because I didn't hear anything about what happens to children before they get to school. About the importance of early childhood, those, those six years before they get to school, you talked about the 61 million children not in school, the, the 200 million children who never develop to their potential. Those are part of the 61 million. Um, the Malalas of the world were hope in their mother's womb. They were babies and preschoolers, or toddlers first, preschoolers. They were early school agers. The, the, the conditions that made Malala who she is to be able to advocate for what she wanted, all those kinds of things led up to uh, what she needed. There's that great global campaign for education video that they did a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. And they had the babies being born, and then they had the babies going to school. And then there was that huge vacuum that wasn't shown on that video, what happens to kids between prenatal and getting to school. So my question is, what does the early childhood community need to do to ensure that the education advocates make early child, because I know it's their business, because it's in GCE's policy, it's in the pillars, it's in Education First, it's in the World Bank's agenda, it is a key pillar. But when we get on the, the stage and we talk about, you know, we, we don't hear that. And okay. I think we need that kind of visibility, because I know that people understand the importance of it. The evidence is there, the programs are there. How do we make sure that Early childhood is the business of education and health and protection because it's not its individual sector and it is a cross-cutting issue and we need to okay. position it in the post-2015. So Thanks, Louise. I think we got it. So how, do, how does it yeah, become I one of the top it. three yeah. talking points? No, got yes. the question. Yes. Yeah, great. Ritu, you're next. Thank you. I think, Wait uh, for the mic. Uh, Ritu Sharma with Women Thrive Worldwide. Uh, always great to hear you both speak. One of the things I think would be helpful to talk about is in this conversation where we're really talking a lot about the donor perspective mm -hmm. and mobilizing resources from donor countries. But as you rightly pointed out, um, the largest majority of the poorest of the poor are now in middle income countries, China, India, Brazil. How do we engage constructively with countries to make education a priority for themselves as opposed to defense or opposed to other things where they choose to invest? And how can we work with them to mobilize their own domestic resources? For example, looking at their own tax policy and how they do or do not collect revenues from those who have wealth um, in their country. I think this is a really critical piece that we maybe we're nervous to talk about it. <coughs> Great, there's two more questions, one at the very back. Someone, yeah, Lucy. Yeah, thanks. And I'm Lucy Lake from CAMFED International. And I want to thank the speakers for a really passionate and inspirational um, forum this afternoon. I think one of the big issues that needs to be on the agenda is the issue of accountability. Because one of the most daunting and devastating aspects of working on the front line is hearing the high level commitments and seeing the trickle of resources that actually reach those who are the intended clients, the intended beneficiaries. So I think that issue of really revisiting the architecture of aid and of the governance over these resources to ensure that we are truly accountable to the children, to the girls who are our clients is a critical issue that we need to put at the front end of this agenda. Manas, last question. Uh, 
Hello, good afternoon. I'm Mehnaz Aziz. And uh, 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 we in Pakistan uh, at this point in time are uh, uh, facing a huge challenge. It is not a challenge that the Taliban bring into the country uh, for shooting Malala, but it is the writ of the state and the commitment of the state to education. Sir, when you recently visited Pakistan, Mr. Zardari, our President Zardari, did commit to you that he is responsible for education and he yeah. will yeah. make it his first priority. But once you leave, does he really do it? So what are the mechanisms and how can we make the elected representatives accountable? Uh, for each constituency because we work, we are the frontliners, we work from one constituency to the others. I'm holding deliberations at the district level. Parents want their children to go to school. Parents want their girls to go to school. There are no schools. There is nobody to ensure that uh, uh, there, there are enough schools. Right now we are in another crisis. There is no national accountability. Post-devolution, post-18th Amendment, the government has committed to an Article 25A that they are responsible for providing uh, free and fair, um, uh, you know, free education to 6 to 16-year-old. But the implementation is nowhere to be seen. Even the laws are not passed except for the, in the Islamabad capital territory. So, you know, engaging with a country like Pakistan, which will be one of those five or six very, very demanding countries at this time, would be looking at it in a very, very different way as to who will be responsible and what is the social accountability mechanism. Great. Um, Jean, you want to tackle one or two of those questions? I know early childhood has been a passion of yours domestically in the past. Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, we st I'm actually been happy uh, to see the degree that that is part of the framework now. I think when I came into the government even five years ago, uh, it was not as much. Now, progress is slow. Um, so, I, look, I think I think you do get the challenge of. Uh, uh, you know, I think one of the brutal things in this area is that there is so much and you do need significant resources and uh, how, you, how you do that balance when you have places that don't even have quality teachers, uh, uh, you know, at first, second, and third grade, uh, and how you have uh, early childhood uh, uh, policies that are, you know, lot major expansions, um, you know, is, is an enormous challenge. And I think you know, I go back to what I say. I think that uh, uh, I think there's been an increase because of people like yourself in the success, the documented success. I think that that puts it more on the agenda. Uh, it's a strain uh, uh, because you are already straining to hit your you know existing uh, uh, agendas. I always <laughs> used to say that the. Uh, Millennium Development Goal for Education was the world's most ambitious and pathetic goal. <laughs> ambitious because so difficult, so tens of millions of children away, and yet, uh, you know, whenever I used to go speak to classes, like little kids, like during Global Education Week, the first question was always, why only primary education? And I never had a very good answer to that. <laughs> um, and I think the same can be said the other way, which is, you know, why not early childhood as well? Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I think this is an area you have to push. I think there has been progress, though. I can see even in the five, six years that I've been back doing uh, crisis economic policy in the United States. <laughs> um, for the woman from CAMFED, we do fantastic work. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm... I think what you're talking about is very important at all levels. It's obviously important to the people, the intended recipients. It's kind of a crime, uh, you, you know, if, uh, if money was in a school for kids and it was stolen, it would be a crime. Uh, the fact that somehow uh, it gets taken on the way there may not be technically a crime, but it has the same impact for, for them. But I also actually think you, you know, you, I wouldn't distinguish it from the donor side because I think that when you sit around government tables and you talk about what uh, uh, gives people the confidence or even foundation tables to give resources, uh, Rebecca's going to laugh at me, but I wrote several papers. I think when, when I started to know Rebecca and she, we, were, I start, we started to work on conflict education, one of the things we wrote about, particularly in that area, but it's true across, was what we call trust gaps. That, uh, uh, that 
you know, even when you go to somebody in the United States and you try to say you should give more resources or you should tell your member of Congress to support more resources, for a lot of people, it is the feeling that it won't get there. It won't actually make a difference. Then that leads to everybody only wanting to sponsoring a child. Then everybody has to explain to them that that's an administrative nightmare. But it tells you something. There's a trust gap there. And, it, and, and, here, and the hardest part is, it is worse the, most, the, the more conflict-ridden a country is. Then the trust becomes not only does the money not get there, it's going to someplace bad uh, that works against the foreign policy interest of the government uh, or the donors. So I think this <clears throat> is a crucial issue. It is crucial for the recipients, but I actually think it is tightly related to getting more resources, is closing the trust gaps. And I think we have to ask ourselves, uh, uh, you know, what we do, whether that's uh, different kinds of, you know, transparent pooling, accountability, both at the kind of donor level, at the school level, you know, you, you, you know, you know of models in different countries <clears throat> where they have to post, you know, the money they received, what went to it, how you do that on the way from the central government down to the school, et cetera is a place where I think, uh, I think a lot more progress is needed. I think we all know ex examples of cases where that's gotten better, but I, I think that is, uh, you know, it's the wonky, less glamorous world that I live in already, which is budget accountability <laughs> and transparency. But, it, but it's wonky in that sense, but in a larger sense, it is about trust. It is the trust of people providing money either through their own taxes or a foundation or another country, and it's the trust uh, uh, that from the, peop the recipients that, that the money that was designed to empower their children actually goes to that purpose. Great. Thanks. Gordon, what about the Pakistan question or Ritu's question about Brazil? Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I say, first of all, because yeah. Jean is here and it's the first time I've had the chance to, to do this, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, our debt of gratitude to, to Jean because he not only created the, the, you know, the, the center here for, for, for universal education, but he has been the inspiration behind so many of the educational uh, movements and campaigns uh, throughout the world. And I know of his personal commitment because uh, when he was out of office and uh, <laughs> I was still in office, the position is a bit reversed now, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> when he was uh, out of office, I did ask him to come and do a big job in the United Kingdom, and he said no, he was going to set up the Center for Universal Education, and, and that shows a, a real commitment that I... I do, I, do, I do applaud. Jean, you, you mentioned uh, during your speech that you, you managed to find, um, was it $30 million during very tough budget negotiations for universal and global education? Perhaps uh, during these tough budget negotiations, <laughs> you might look again and see if there's anything that can be done. Because <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's very good. The only very, two words, the only words to very, say are touche and fair enough. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, very, it's very good of you, as, as you're threatening to descend this fiscal cliff, it's very good of you if you could help us ascend this uh, education uh, uh, mountain. Now, two, two of the questions are about uh, the, the role of uh, domestic governments, national, national governments, and I'll come back to nursery education and accountability in a minute, about the, the failure of the Pakistan uh, government, about the failure of, of politicians, really, unless they are pressed to take seriously the issue of education, and, and it does lead to questions about... Uh, uh, po politicians, you know, in my country, there's this great uh, saying by uh, Shelley, the poet, about uh, about uh, his definition of a politician: lost the art of communication, but not, alas, the gift of speech. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there may be, there may be some uh, truth in that. And I think I think the the issue that I was raising was: uh, look, po politicians are under enormous number of different pressures, and you can doubt the motives in certain respects. The only way that we can ensure that political leaders take seriously the questions of education is if we keep pressing them. And that's why I was so uh, delighted when I went to Pakistan to find that there is a civil society movement that is pressing, and you are part of it, and I congratulate you, you're the leading part of it, pressing the case for education in Pakistan. And it's no accident that as a result of the pressure that you have brought to bear, Pakistan not only passed the legislation for compulsory education when, uh, when I was uh, there, it also, at the same time, gave scholarships to three million students who didn't have them, and they are discussing all the political parties doubling the proportion of uh, education in the expenditure of GDP from 2% to 4%, which is not enough, but is a major, major uh, change. And I think the only guarantee that we have in these areas uh, that politicians will take seriously, and I speak as a, a person who 
who was, not is, was a politician, the only guarantee is if you keep pressing. Uh, and you should not underestimate your ability to have an influence on these uh, debates. Uh, and indeed, if we are to succeed in meeting the Millennium Development Goal, uh, and because Jean is right, I've never seen access and quality and contradiction raise the quality of education worldwide, it will be because of the pressure that is brought to bear. And one of the things that I would like to do, and it may be worthy of discussion at a, at a later stage, I, I would like us to be able to publicize in a more effective way than is possible the work of so many great educational uh, organizations and philanthropic and uh, voluntary uh, and uh, foundations who are involved in education. And I feel that you deserve uh, the organizations who are here that there is a, a voice that is pressing your case and telling people of the work you do. Uh, and I've thought that we could uh, develop a website where by getting guarantees from businesses, because I think businesses, corporate philanthropy in education is very poor in relation to corporate philanthropy in health and other areas, get business involved, we could have uh, a cost-free way of people making uh, subscription, giving donations uh, to educational organizations in, in, in other countries, remove the administrative cost, remove the cost of the transaction, uh, give uh, some uh, uh, guarantee that there will be accountability once the money reaches another country uh, by ensuring that there are people who will report back on the success of any uh, sponsorship or any philanthropic uh, effort. And I think we ought to seriously think about how together we can raise the profile of educational uh, contributions and educational uh, uh, foundations and educational organizations that are doing great things in education around the world who haven't had uh, the, uh, the public airing that they deserve uh, and you deserve uh, for the work that you're doing. Now, on, on the specific question, just to be very brief, uh, I uh, uh, was determined when I was in government that uh, we would focus on preschool education. So we made uh, nursery education compulsory for three and four-year-olds. We created what's called Stuart Start, which is... Uh, uh, for two-year-olds and even for some children under two to get them the chance to get into a learning environment very early. And I'm convinced that the first 48 months are more important than the next 48 years. And I think most people who study education, and you've got Professor Heckman here tomorrow, who has actually made his life's work to show that, uh, will believe that that is, uh, that is to be the case. And I do not uh, undervalue uh, the importance. And when I go to look at a country now, I'm looking at what they're doing in preschool education as well. The reason I focus on the Millennium Development Goal is I don't want us to uh, be guilty of betrayal. I think if you make a promise, you've got to keep it. And I think if you make a promise to children, particularly, you've got to keep it. And I don't see, I'll be honest, how any future Millennium Development Goal can carry credibility with the people who we are making that promise to, if we haven't made the biggest possible effort to achieve the current Millennium Development Goal. And that's why uh, I want to emphasize the importance of going faster and further and more quickly uh, towards 2015. I, I, I accept also the issues about accountability, but again, it comes back to public pressure. You know, when I was at school, and I was in a Scottish education system, and it, we thought of ourselves as the best education system in the world because we had the first free education of, uh, of any country uh, in, in the world in the 1690s uh, for every child. Uh, but there was no um, uh, uh, pressure for uh, parents to have a role in education. There was no pressure for the community to uh, demand accountability. It was essentially a system that was left uh, to the teachers and to, and, to, and to politicians. And that has changed in our country. It's going to change in every country. And the accountability is best exercised by encouraging uh, an active uh, public, uh, the participation of parents, the participation of the community, the position, participation of people who are concerned, uh, business as well, about the future of the economy and the society if you don't invest properly in education. So I'm, I'm afraid to say that the message I gave at the beginning is the same as the message I give at the end. We will succeed only if you succeed. So we will succeed together if we can raise the public profile of education and make sure people take seriously what we are saying publicize the great things that are, are being done and make sure we show people that this is a challenge that, as Jean said more eloquently than I did, this is a challenge which is indeed a life and death matter about the future of, of, of our children. My, my final point, I was in Africa a few years ago. I met a young girl uh, called Miriam. I'll never forget that experience because she was an AIDS victim. Uh, she was an orphan. Her, her father and mother had both died. She was being passed from family to family. She had tuberculosis. I was absolutely sure when I met her that she was suffering from that, that, that as well. And this was a girl of 12, and there was no hope in her eyes. You looked into her eyes, and she 
had no optimism. You could see there was nothing that she was hopeful about in the future. Now, I'm not going to name the charity, but because of the work of one charity, one foundation, that girl, uh, I know for a fact, uh, is doing well. She's in education. She's getting the benefit of, uh, of learning. And she's now uh, part of uh, a wider group of people who are taking uh, care of us. So don't ever believe that if you help just one person, it doesn't make a difference. But just believe that by acting to help millions of people, we're going to change the world. Thank you. <laughs>